In the name of God, most merciful, ever merciful, may God's peace and blessings be upon his holy prophet Muhammad and the purified members of his household and project. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad wa achi farjahum. Brothers, sisters, and dear respected viewers, assalamu alaikum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. As you know, the holy month of Ramadan is supposed to be the month of faith, spirituality, nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the month where we try to reacquaint ourselves with the Holy Quran. But at the same time, it's supposed to be a month where we pause and reflect upon ourselves, we contemplate our lives, and one of the best ways to do this is to go back to very important figures and events in Islam and try to extract lessons from them that we can apply in our daily lives. And the holy month of Ramadan itself is uh, a month that actually contains some of these different events that are really worth pondering, thinking about, exploring, and studying. And there are a number of these events in the holy month of Ramadan. One of these events uh, that happens to fall on the 10th of the month of Ramadan is the sad event of the demise, the passing away of uh, Our Lady, Sayyidah Khadija al Kubra. May God's peace and blessings be upon her. Khadija السلام, is one of the most important first of all, wives of the Holy Prophet, the most important one, one of the most important people in the life of the Holy Prophet in general, one of the most important people to the foundation of our religion itself, and I would argue one of the most important figures that need to be studied in the history of religious figures in general. And unfortunately, this is not something that we have often done. But at this time specifically, where there is so much talk about, especially topics that are related to feminism and the empowerment of women and the gender roles and the like, this studying of the life of a figure like the one, like Khadija becomes extremely crucial, it's extremely important and needs to be given that type of uh, profile and, and needs to be highlighted. In the little time that we have, we can't really go through the entire biography of the life of Sayyid Khadija السلام, such an eventful life. But at the same time, I think that we can at least take a little bit of time to highlight the big events, some of the uh, you know more eventful chapters of her life, and think about them and try also to alleviate and answer some of the misconceptions around the biography and the life of Sayyidah Khadija Sayyidah Khadija deserves to be studied not just as the wife of the Holy Prophet, and we will come back to this point, inshallah. This is someone who personified generosity, sacrifice, strength, altruism, and needs to be studied on her own as a figure. So if we look at her life and her biography right from the beginning, the first thing that I think the most, most of us have heard is that her name is Khadija bint Khuwaylid. So we start, we begin from this name of Khuwaylid. Who was Khuwaylid? And in very short, Khuwaylid was uh, the cousin of the mother of the Holy Prophet, Amin alayhi salam. So Khadija is a far cousin of the Holy Prophet, and these were generally people, the parents of the Holy Prophet, their cousins of their families. They were people who were still abiding by the teachings and the instructions followed by the Arabs living in that region of the Arabian Peninsula uh, who were derived or who had migrated there and lived with the people who had derived and were descendants of Prophet Ismail السلام, and the tribes that lived there. And so they were still considered to be uh, Hanifiyin. They were still, uh, you know, oftentimes it's translated simply as Hanifs, people who are still worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, in a manner that is customary to 
the teachings of Prophet Ibrahim السلام, they believed in one God and so Khadija السلام, grew up in an environment where she was no stranger to things such as dua and salah and hajj and charity and the high values and moral values that we all know in our religion. Then uh, as she was growing into a woman, one of the things that happened is that her father passes away and so she inherits his business. And this is something that is very, very uh, well known about the life of Khadija السلام, but before we jump into that, I think there's something that needs to be highlighted because it translates into the way she managed her business and all of the affairs of her life, peace be upon her. And this is that Anyone who studies the life of Khadija objectively, even before associating with the Holy Prophet, before becoming the wife of the Prophet, before Islam, she was clearly in every dimension, in every part of her life, she was extraordinary. There's nothing ordinary about this woman. She was recognized and she was admired for and she was respected for her great beauty. She was uh, admired and respected for her intelligence, for her wisdom, for her judgment for her generosity. Uh, they say, for instance, that during that time, this is very well known, uh, how the Arabs were dealing with their daughters when a, an Arab would be, as the whole Quran says, uh, in multiple places in the Quran, how it says that when one of them uh, receives the news that he is about to get a daughter or a daughter has been born to him, his face becomes dark. Uh, or that in another verse of Surah Al-Taqwil, when the Quran says, وَإِذَا الْمَوْعُودَةُ سُئِلَتْ بِأَيِّ ذَنْبًا قُتِلَتْ The newborn girl will be asked why, what crime did she commit for her to be murdered. And so this was customary in the habits of those Arabs pre-Islamically, and this is one of the things that Islam abolished. But even before all of that, Khadija السلام, was known to have opened her house, and the woman knew about this that any woman who ever needed any shelter for herself or her, for her newborn daughter, that she could come to the house of Khadija to seek refuge or to leave her daughter there, to be raised as an orphan, to be supported by Khadija in her house. This is before Islam. And so this is where we see that there are people when they are given these uh, blessings from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, someone who has a position of power or they have wealth or uh, those kinds of blessings from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, unfortunately, these can become means to go astray because you have now more access to haram, you have now more reasons to perform haram. But at the same time, there are people who use those positions or use that wealth to turn more towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for instance, by helping others. So in any case, as we said, these beautiful, noble characters that we find in in uh, Sayyidina Khadija alayhi salam, they translated into her business life as well. So as soon as she inherits the business of her father, one of the first things that she does, and this is really noteworthy, we could spend a very long time just dissecting and talking about this. One of the first things that she does, we are told, is that she knows she inherits a, a prosperous, big business the first thing that she does is that she goes to the Kaaba to perform tawaf, to give thanks to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and at the same time to seek the counsel, to seek the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now that I have received this new blessing, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I am asking you to help me manage it in the correct way, to do right by what I have just been given. And this is something very important for all of us to keep in mind. We are all going through school, through business, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes. And in all of this, we have to keep Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala front and center in our worldview. We can't forget that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who is bestowing and not really just focus on people and the material means around all of this. And so we see Khadija alayhi salam, the first thing that she does with that wealth and that business that she inherits is that she turns to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and performs a tawaf that is customary to them. This is way before Islam. The second thing that she does, and this is extremely important as well, and again, deserves a very long discussion that we don't have time for, is that she knows the kind of world that the business world was 
especially at that time. It's, a, it's an aggressive world, a world of men, a world where uh, there is a lot of cheating and a lot of back and forth and a lot of mingling between different people, but there is clearly a gender component to the manner in which you enter into this, into this world of business. You cannot be neglectful. You cannot pretend like there is no difference between men and women when it comes to entering the business world, especially at that time when uh, Khadija was alive and entering that business world. And because she is the pure woman and the chaste woman and the woman who has very high moral standards, a woman who does not want to compromise any of her values, her dignity, her respect, she doesn't want to sink lower than what she really is and what she really represents by entering into the world of business in that way directly. So what does she do? She hires an agent so that that person becomes the intermediary between her and the business world, which is a world dominated by men that she doesn't want to mingle with. She doesn't want to enter into that world directly. And so she hires a man, a trustworthy man, by the name of Mesa, and he becomes the agent, he becomes the agent of Khadija for her business transactions. And so when this begins, we are told, you know, before going too far, just so that we have an appreciation, because we're going to refer to this point a lot throughout the discussion, just to get an appreciation of the wealth that was under the hands and the, under the control of Khadija, we are told that her entire merchandise moving back and forth was on and she owned 1,000 camels. By today's standards, we would say you have enough merchandise and you have enough wealth that at any given point in time, you have 1,000 trucks full of merchandise going back and forth. Just so that we have an appreciation of what type of wealth we're talking about. In other reports, we are told that Quraysh had the habit usually of sending caravans made up of 100 camels. Every time they sent one of those caravans, 10 of the camels were dedicated to Khadija. She reserved 10 spots on the caravan because she, her wealth represented 10% of the wealth of Quraysh. Just so that we know that there is no uh, disagreement about the fact that she was the wealthiest woman in the Arabian Peninsula and one of the wealthiest individuals in general in the Arabian Peninsula. So this Mesa agent of, of Khadija goes on the hunt because he's looking for a manager for one of these caravans. And the news reaches the uncle and the protector of the Holy Prophet Abu Talib that they are looking for someone to go and manage the transactions, the merchandise transactions of this caravan. And so he tells them about his nephew, he recommends his nephew, the Holy Prophet and Mesa agrees and the Holy Prophet agree. And so he departs with the caravan uh, led by Mesa, the caravan of Khadija for the uh, merchandise transactions. When they come back, Mesa returns to Khadija to give her a report of what he saw and how well they did. And so one of the questions that she explicitly asks from him is, what about this man that you hired to do the dealings that we had? What did you see from him? How did it go? And in short, he basically tells her, I did not, I have never encountered a man such as this one. Everything about him was different. Most of the time, he seemed to be in contemplation. He seemed to be thoughtful. He never cheats anyone, neither a dirham nor a dinar, not, not a small sum nor a big sum. He never cheats anyone. He is extremely trustworthy. You could read leave the entire caravan with him, and nothing would go missing when he would come back. And finally, and to Mesa most importantly, he tells her that this is a blessed man because we have never made such a profit before. He, despite the fact that he doesn't lie and he doesn't cheat, he still is able to make a lot more money than we could ever expect. We doubled our profits from before. So because of the character that we described to Lady Khadija, say the Khadija before, when she heard the traits of this man, the Holy Prophet this is someone who simply sat in her heart, and we have narrations with those words specifically. 
that he sat in her heart. And so she went and met with one of her very close friends, an intimate friend by the name of Nafisa. She spoke to her and she told her, I have heard about such a man. He has been tested. These are his characteristics. And I wish to propose to marry him. And so she wants to see what her friend thinks. So her friend Nafisa told her, absolutely, go for it. You are a woman of great distinction. They will never refuse. And the best way to do so is to go through his uncles. And so a message was sent to the protector and the uncle of the Holy Prophet, Abu Talib, once again. We find him in every single chapter and section of the life of the Holy Prophet until his demise. And so the message comes to Abu Talib, he sits with the Holy Prophet and he tells him that there is a proposal that has come to you from none other than Khadija. She is interested in marrying you. Would you be interested in asking for her hand in marriage? And the Holy Prophet agrees. And so a group of men from Bani Hashim and the Holy Prophet and that group headed by Abu Talib, they go to pay visit to the family of Khadija al Kubra and ask for her hand in marriage. And this is when Abu Talib gives a very famous sermon in which he describes the Holy Prophet. And he explains that the Holy Prophet is someone who has descended directly from the lineage of Prophet Ibrahim and that his traits and his noble character are unmatched, that this is the best son that anyone could ever hope and wish for, and that if people are like him or for such people, Others should be flocking to them to ask for their hand in marriage. So with all of this said, and imagine the scenario where they are talking to the uncles, in this case of Khadija we are told that Khadija is standing on the side listening. And one of her uncles said, despite everything that you have said, we reject. We object to this because the Holy Prophet is not someone who has the economic status and the wealth that is appropriate to marry someone like Khadija. So Khadija السلام, intervened herself and she said, I have money and I have wealth and if it is a matter of the dowry of the maha, then I will pay my own dowry and I will be the one sustaining. So if it is a matter of money and wealth, I will take care of that so long as there is no other objections and no other issues. And so the marriage was agreed upon and Khadija herself ordered that one of the camels be slaughtered in celebration and the food was uh, distributed on the people. Their married life began at that point. Now, one of the things that we need to learn from this is that in a lot of cases, many of us maybe we think that because we are good or because we are worshipping Allah and we believe in Him and we go to the mosque and we give charity, that our lives need to become easy, without any hardships and without any difficulties. If you look at the life of Khadija with the Holy Prophet these are two people, as we shall see, that are absolutely exceptional of a character. And we're going to see the hadith about that. And yet we see how their life from the very beginning was full of difficulties and struggles. Not because there were issues between them, but because of difficulties that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends their way as tests. And this is something that we cannot forget. If we are in this life, it is because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to test us. Each one of these tests is an option for us. If we choose one path, it becomes an opportunity and reward. If we choose the other path, it becomes punishment. We fail. This is if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is testing us with something, He knows that we can handle it. He will not test us with something beyond our ability. And so we look at their life from the very beginning and we see, for instance, one of the issues is that Khadija was teased by many of the women at that time that she had married someone below her in wealth and economic status. But she persevered and this did not impact her at all. And then afterwards, she gave birth to a number of children to the Holy Prophet, both girls and boys. But every time these children were either dying at birth or they would die shortly thereafter. The only child that survived until adulthood was none other than Fatima al-Zahra and this happened later. During those years, 
the mushrikeen of Quraysh and many of their women would come and they would harass Khadija and they would remind her how the mushrikeen of Quraysh referred to the Holy Prophet as an abta, an abta, constantly as an abta is the animal whose tail has been cut off because he has no tail so when it's in reference to a man it means he has no lineage, he has no continuity he has no legacy, no one to carry his name and we see these difficulties come through the, in the way of Khadija and the Holy Prophet, she did not say, I'm going to stop worshipping, and I'm going to stop praying, and I'm going to stop going to the mosque, and I'm going to stop having any relation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If there is a God, well, I am Allah, as some people say, then why is he not answering my prayers? Therefore, all of this doesn't mean anything. And because of this weakness of faith, we lose completely our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and any reward that would be associated with going through these struggles. Instead, she met these struggles with patience and perseverance and resilience, and her life with the Holy Prophet only increased in love and respect and in admiration on both sides. And so, this is also something that we notice as these difficulties increased, it continued as the Holy Prophet started on his prophetic mission, and things got even worse and his relationship with Quraysh to the point where Quraysh decided to, after they started torturing and punishing anyone who would associate with the Muslims, it led to the point where Quraysh completely boycotted anyone who was Muslim and they tried to assassinate the Holy Prophet a number of times. Finally, Abu Talib said, come and use the valley that I have. There's a large crack between two mountains that is considered the valley of Abu Talib, Shah of Abu Talib. And he said, you come and you start living here. And during that time when the entire Islamic community was boycotted, where it was forbidden for anyone to exchange anything with anyone who was a Muslim, to sell to them or buy from them or marry from them, the one person who sustained the entire Islamic community was Khadija through her love. Quickly the other Muslims, many of whom were already very poor when they joined the ranks of the Holy Prophet and became his supporters, they completely ran out of money. And so Khadija became the one who would sustain the entire Islamic community. And if you can think about it for those three years, because there was a boycott, something that should cost one dirham, because it's uh, forbidden for them to do any interactions with them, that thing that should cost one dirham now costs 10 or 50 or 100. And so she would have no hesitation in spending her wealth in support of the Muslim community at that time. To the point where we are told, and we, we are inshallah going to come back to this a little bit later, we are told that her entire wealth ran out. And the Muslims, two and three and more men would share a single date. And that the Muslims started to eat grass because there is nothing else to eat. That's the kind of difficulty that was going on at that time, and during all of this we see that Khadija remained strong, resilient, never hesitated, never created any sort of problems for the Holy Prophet Whereas, if you go through the Holy Quran, for instance, you see how in Surah Al-Ahzab and Surah Al-Tahreem, clear references where Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala talks to some of the wives of the Holy Prophet because of the problems that they are creating to the Holy Prophet. In one surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in surah al-Ahzab, he tells the wives of the Prophet, if you are interested in the things of this world, then come, and I will give you the things of this world, then I will divorce you. And in surah al-Tahreem, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells that some of the wives of the Holy Prophet that they are, if they are not going to ask Allah forgiveness, and they don't start spilling the secrets of the Holy Prophet, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has become their enemy. And the angels and the believers have become the enemies of those wives. So this is a completely different type of narrative and discourse that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is using with these wives and we shall see with the wife of the Holy Prophet, the first one, Khadija al Kubra, sallallahu alayhi In the few minutes that I have left, I wanted to quickly go over some, perhaps, of the misconceptions associated with Khadija alayhi salam. We constantly hear about them, and I think it's worth at least touching on. These misconceptions, their sources are well known. They're the same type of misconceptions that we find. For instance, claims that the father of Imam Ali, alayhi salam, Abu Talib, died a mushrik, for instance. 
Whereas Imam Hassan alayhi salam married and divorced women all the time. Whereas Imam Hussain alayhi salam had a disagreement with Imam Hassan and they never agreed on anything, especially politically. These are fabrications that we find, distortions that were introduced in history by out of enmity against the Holy Prophet, especially by the Umayyah, but for ideological reasons too, to enhance the profile of some people and diminish the profile of Ahlul Bayt and people like Khadija, as we shall see. So one of these is has to do with the issue of her marrying the Holy Prophet. Was Khadija truly, as many of the misconceptions say, was she truly a woman of 40 or 45? So when we go through the different reports, there are many reports about her age. In fact, it's actually mind-boggling that someone's age can create so much controversy. We have, we have this woman that we have sayings about her age being 25, 26, 28, all the way to being in her 40s. And so this is already something that should indicate that there is more than just a historical issue here. Why would historians disagree so much on someone's age? And in this case, clearly, it is because there are ideological reasons. Perhaps out of love for some other wives of the Holy Prophet to, to enhance their profile, fabrications have been made about the figure of Khadija al-Kubra and so in an attempt to show that she was a much older woman when the Holy Prophet married her, one, and two, that she had been married once or perhaps twice before the Holy Prophet already, and three, that she already had one or two or more kids from other men before the Holy Prophet because these things were supposed to be important for those historians and the Arabs of that time. The first point about this is that even if Khadija was a woman of 40 or a woman of 45 or a woman who had been widowed, married once or twice before and had children, there is no issue in that in itself. This is not going to elevate or decrease her rank in any way. And as we shall see, this is not the merit and the worth of Khadija, neither in the eyes of the Holy Prophet, nor in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's first. Secondly, secondly is that these are pure fabrications. There is nothing that you can rely on. And if we would go back through history, you see that there is no evidence to show that Khadija was actually married before the Holy Prophet or that she was in her 40s or more. Khadija most likely was a woman of about 25, 26, very close in age to the Holy Prophet when she married the Holy Prophet and she had not been married before and she did not have children before the Holy Prophet. In any case, so this is simply to mention things very quickly. As we said, there are ideological reasons for a lot of this and we are going to see some of that to recognize the worth of Khadija, one of the misconceptions is that all the scholars of Islam, any good Muslim should know that Khadija was the greatest of the wives of the Holy Prophet. This is unanimous in Islam. There is no disagreement about this. But unfortunately, there is a focus perhaps elsewhere and distortions elsewhere that remove and take away from her character. And Khadija is way beyond just one of the greatest wives of the Holy Prophet. She is one of the greatest personalities in all of Islam, not to say in all of humanity, as the Holy Prophet says. She is not to be compared with any one of the wives of the Holy Prophet. This is not her rank. We have many narrations in which the Holy Prophet himself says that Khadija is one of Sayyidat Nisa Alamiha. She is the foremost woman of her world, of her Ummah, just as Mary was in her time. So if this is her rank, then she is not to be compared with anyone else of the ordinary people. In any case, so very quickly, if we go through some of the narrations associated with this, and these, of course, show the rank and the status of Khadija, not only as a wife of the Holy Prophet, but how the Holy Prophet viewed her beyond being a wife, just as a human being, and what stood out to him in Khadija I wanted to report a couple of things from Aisha. Aisha reports this in the most authentic books, in Sahih al-Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, Tarmadi, uh, uh, in Ahmed's uh, 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 authentic books, in Nasa'i. These are the narrations that are reported in a mutawatir way. They are considered agreed upon. In the first one, she says, uh, Aisha says, 
ما غرت على أحد من نساء النبي صلى الله عليه وآله ما غرت على خديجة I have never become as jealous of any of the wives of the Holy Prophet as I became towards خديجة وما رأيتها And I had never seen her and yet my jealousy towards her was the greatest ولكن كان النبي صلى الله عليه وآله يكثر ذكرها But the Holy Prophet never stopped mentioning her. And he would slaughter the sheep, cut it in pieces, and then he would send the parts to the friends of Khadija. Out of love for Khadija, the Holy Prophet takes care of the friends of Khadija. Inshallah, this is something we, we keep in mind that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees us as those who love Khadija so that the Holy Prophet loves us in return as he loved her friends and would take care of them years after the passing away of the Holy Prophet. فَرُبَّمَا قُلْتُ لَهُ عَائِشَ says So maybe I said to him كَأَنَّهُ لَمْ يَكُنْ فِي الدُّنْيَا إِمْرَأَةٌ إِلَّا خَدِيجَ You act as though there is no other woman in this world except Khadija. فيقول, and then he would say, and I'll come back to this, فيقول, So he would answer Aisha in this report, we're going to see another one. In this one, we see the Holy Prophet would say, he would start enumerating her merits. He would say, because she was so, and she was so. But she doesn't say what he would actually say, but we have an indication of that elsewhere. So that's first. And here, when, when, Khadib, when Aisha says that the Holy Prophet would act in a way that would force Aisha to the point to say, it's as though there is not a single other woman in this world. This tells us how much the Holy Prophet loved Khadija, how much and how often he would mention her. And this is years after her passing away. And yeah, let's move quickly to, this one is mentioned in a number of books, including the ones that I mentioned, including Siyar Alam and the Bala. Again from Aisha, she says, كان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله إذا ذكر كان إذا ذكر خديجة لم يكن يسأم من ثناء عليها واستغفار لها. If he would mention, if he would remember خديجة, he would not stop, he would not cease praising her and asking God's forgiveness for her. فذكرها يوما فحملتني الغيرة فقلت. One day he mentioned her and so jealousy overtook me. So I said. لَقَدْ عَوَّلَكَ اللَّهُ مِنْ كَبِيرَةِ السَّنْ God has replaced the old one by others for you. أَلَا زِلْتَ تَذْكُرُهَا أَلَمْ يُبْدِلْكَ اللَّهُ خَيْرًا مِنْهَا Will you continue to mention her? Has God not granted you better than her? فَرَأَيْتَهُ غَضِبَ غَضَبًا أُسْقِطَ فِي خُلْدِي وَقُلْتُ فِي نَفْسِي I saw him so angered that I feared and stopped and started thinking to myself, Allahumma, so she made an oath, a promise with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allahumma, in adhabta ghalaba rasulika anni, if you make the anger of your messenger go away from me, lam a'ud adhkurha bisu. I will never mention her again in ill talk. I will not insult her again. I will not speak ill of her again which basically tells us that she would do this all the time. But in this case, because it angered the Prophet to this point, then she made this oath that she wouldn't do it after this. When the Holy Prophet saw my state, and to me it seems that the Holy Prophet waited for her. He knows that she regretted it when she saw his anger, so he waited a little, and then he said, What are you saying? Wallah, and in another narration, he says it three times. He swears by God three times. Wallah, Wallah, Wallah. Ma abdalaillahu khayron Allah has not granted me better than her. Saddafatni hina kaddabani nas. And this is the merit of Khadija. Not that she's a widow or a virgin, or she's four years old, or she has children or not. Saddafatni hina kaddabani nas. She considered me trustworthy and telling the truth when everybody considered me a liar. And she believed in me. When everybody disbelieved in me, she believed in me. And another narration, When people boycotted me and rejected me, she's the one who sacrificed her wealth for me. For Allah, 
that I have. So I swear by God that I will not or never forget her. Uh, forget her. So this is where we see the great merits of Khadija And there is an important point here that I mentioned at the beginning and I want to come back to very quickly. It's that Khadija salam's greatness does not come from the fact that she is only associated to the Holy Prophet. Yes, this increases her in rank, that she has been associated and the Holy Prophet has chosen her. And in fact, it can be argued that she is the only wife of the Holy Prophet whom he chose really for the wifely purpose. And that there, it, it did not have any theological or political or other reasons for the marriage. And when the Holy Prophet did that, we see even the Imams, when they talk about Khadija, it gives them great pride to say that they are the descendants of Khadija. We have Imam Hussein salam on the tenth of Ashura, even when he talked and he gave a sermon, he said, Anam Khadija al-Qurran. I am the son of Khadija al-Qurran. Imam Zayd al when he gave his sermon, he said, Anam Khadija al-Qurran. Khadija stands on her own. And the fact that she is married to the Holy Prophet, the fact that she is the mother of uh, Fatima al-Zahra salam and other associations, these only add to her rank. But these are not her main ranks. She stands on her own for her greatness, for her sacrifices, for her belief. When the Holy Prophet in addition to help us understand this, the Holy Prophet says, My religion was not able to stand and rise except by the wealth of Khadija and the sword of Ali. And look at this beautiful hadith that gives us a very good indication, and I'll try to wrap it up quickly here. We find this hadith again in all of the Sahar books. This is a unanimously agreed upon book, the uh, hadith, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends Jibra'il alayhi salam to the Holy Prophet. And he says, when Jibra'il alayhi salam reaches the Holy Prophet, he tells him, فَأَقْرَبْهَا فَقْرَبْ عَلَيْهَا السَّلَامُ مِنْ رَبِّهَا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent Jibra'il to talk to the Holy Prophet to tell him to communicate the salam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the Sayyidah Khadija alayhi There is a whole discussion that needs to happen here that we don't have time for. Who does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala send his salams to? Do you know any other human being, a normal person, that has received the direct salam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Salamun ala Muhim fil alamin. Salamun ala Musa wa Harun. But normal, ordinary people receiving the direct salam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through Jibra'il alayhi salam. And so when he reaches and he tells him, and he adds, Jibra'il adds, and he says, وَمِنِّي So Jibra'il makes a point to say and tell her that I also say salam to Khadija alayhi salam. And of course here, we don't have time to go through this, but there are multiple narrations of this, which basically tells us this has worked happened repeatedly. This did not happen only once. It could be even an indication that every time Jibra'il was coming to talk to the Holy Prophet, there was a special salam being sent to Khadija al Kubra. And then, here's where he would say, and this is Allah sending Jibra'il with this. He says, tell her that Allah gives her the glad tidings that there is going to be a house for her in heaven, reserved for her, for her sacrifices in this life a house reserved for her without any noise and without any exhaustion or tiredness. La safa lafihi wa la nasab. And here, there's a, we don't have time for this, but Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani, he comments on this. He says the house, the house that Allah has given her is because the entire house, the household of the Holy Prophet is from Khadija. It's Khadija's doing. She is the mother of Fatima, and it is in her house that Imam Ali alayhi salam grew up, and their association gave rise to Imam Hassan and Imam Hussein and the descendants of the Holy Prophet who are his household. So Ibn Hajar al Asqalani says, and that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives her that house for the house that, that she built in this world. In any case, فَقَالَتْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ هُوَ السَّلَامُ She answers Jibra'il alayhi salam through the Holy Prophet, إِنَّ اللَّهَ هُوَ السَّلَامُ Again here, Ibn Hajar says, 
The second salam, we are not sure if she's talking directly to Jibra'il wa alayka salam. She basically says two salams to him because he is here or she is answering Jibra'il salam through the Holy Prophet and then saying her salam to the Holy Prophet. And there's an entire discussion of why, and this is an indication of her level of advanced knowledge, why someone like Khadija would not say wa alayka salam about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. She says, Allahu huwa salam. Years later, the Muslims would say, Allah is salam or alayhi salam, and the Prophet would tell them, You can't say Allah is salam. If you pray, salam is a prayer of wellness, of peace. You don't pray for peace and wellness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is the peace, and from Him comes the peace. Khadija alayhi salam, already at that level, was saying, Wa alayhi, Allahu huwa salam. Wa ala jibari as salam. Anyways, two last points and we finish. The first one is the Holy Prophet's deep love for Khadija. Two words that would require another lengthy discussion. He says, Inni at ruziktu hubba. This has two meanings. Either the Holy Prophet is thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for granting him the blessing that Khadija loves him, or, and I would say, and, he is thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he loves Khadija. And both of these are absolutely great types of love towards the Holy Prophet or from the Holy Prophet. If there is an attestation that someone truly loves the Holy Prophet, then that's it, that person is safe, and they are in heaven, and they are secured, and anyone should follow them. Because Allah and the Holy Prophet are saying, this is a true lover of the Holy Prophet. And if the Holy Prophet is thanking God that he loves Khadija, then that is an even greater meaning behind the love, because the Holy Prophet would only love something that is pure and beautiful, and something that is worthy of the Holy Prophet's love. The time has advanced, and so at the end of her life, we are told that the protector of the Holy Prophet Abu Talib passes away in his valley, in his shura, and this was a great calamity for the Holy Prophet, a great difficulty for the Holy Prophet. And perhaps 35 days to around 45 days after the demise of Abu Talib, we have Khadija starting to feel the pangs of death, starting to feel that she is about to leave this world. And when she left this world, the Holy Prophet referred to that year as Am al husn that year was the year of grief and sadness for the Holy Prophet She asked her daughter, as she was feeling herself slip away from this world, she asked her daughter Fatima to go call her father because the Holy Prophet oftentimes would not sleep with them out of fear that he might get assassinated. He would often sleep in different places. And she told her, tell him that I am about to leave this world and I have a last will to give him. And so the Holy Prophet rushed, Lama Hadarat al Wafat. So the Holy Prophet rushes to Khadija alayhi salam. He finds her on the ground. This woman who owned the world in her time, now she can't afford anything, and she is lying on the ground, and she is about to die. And the Holy Prophet says that I hate to see you in this way. This is something very regrettable to me to see you in this state. Lama Hadarat al Wafat, Qalat Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, when Khadija was about to. Pass away, she told the Holy Prophet, Ya Rasulullah, Urfu Anni and Qasatu fi Hakrik. The first thing she says is asking the Holy Prophet to forgive her in case there are any shortcomings towards the Holy Prophet. Faqala sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi hasha, ma ra'aytu minki illa khayran, wa qad sa'iti kulla sa'iti, wa tahammalti al-adha wa badalti ma'laki fi sabiyillah. The Holy Prophet said to her, You are too good to be talking about shortcomings. I only saw goodness from you. You're, you struggled as much as one could struggle. And you endured harm in the way of Allah and you sacrificed your wealth in the way of Allah. فَقَالَتْ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ And this was the final wasiyya of uh, uh, Khadija السلام, She said, قَالَتْ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ لِهَذِهِ And then she pointed to Fatima al-Zahra السلام, and she told the Holy Prophet, this is the last will that I leave to you. Make sure, 
This is a girl who will be orphaned and lonely after me. La tu'dihi ra'atun min Quraysh because Khadija went through these difficulties with Quraysh and she knows what they're capable of when they left her. And so she says, make sure that there is none of the women of Quraysh who harm her. وَلَا يَقْرِبْهَا أَحَدٍ عَلَىٰ وَجْهِهَا And make sure that no one hits her on her face. وَلَا يَفْعَنَا أَحَدٍ صَوْتَهُ فِي وَجْهِهَا Or that anyone raises their voice in front of her. وَلَا تَرَى مَكْرُوعَا That no harm ever befalls her. And of course we know how poorly and badly Quraysh took care of the will of Khadija السلام, These people who claim that they love the Holy Prophet and they love his household. The last thing that I will say is in the narrations we are also told that she also asked the Holy Prophet, she told him that she cannot afford a kefan at that time. This woman who owned 10% of the wealth of Quraysh, this wealthy woman is now in a state where she can't afford a kefan. So this greatly hurt the heart of the Holy Prophet and when this happened, of course, the Holy Prophet was grieved by this. She told him, I would like you to take the clothes that are on your soul, on your body, and use them as a kefan for him. She wants the clothes that touched the Holy Body of the Holy Prophet to be used as a kefan. In the narrations, we are told that the Holy Prophet was about to remove his garment and to tell her, I will do as you please. And Jibra'il descended from the heavens and he told the Holy Prophet وآله, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends his salams to Khadija and tells her that there is a house waiting for her in heaven and he sends her a kefan made from clothes from al Jannah, from heaven. And this is in return and in thanks for everything that, the, that she sacrificed in this world. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to better understand and study the life of Khadija Her life deserves to be studied beyond the Shia, beyond the Muslims. Anyone who believes in true values needs to be looking at the character and the pivotal role that Khadija played in her life. As we said, especially in these times, where, when there is so much confusion and so much talk about gender roles, and what allows women to feel empowered, and feminism, and so on and so forth. This is one of the characters that absolutely needs to be studied for all the roles that she played and personified. And of course, we end by saying that Khadija is not a role model for girls or for women. She is a role model for humanity. And that is why she reached that status, and that is why she held that type of love and position in the heart of the Holy Prophet And finally, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us walk in the footsteps of Khadija And as we said, to make us of those whom Khadija feels that we love her so that the Holy Prophet loves us in return. وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين